بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين so we we're, we're going to start lecture number three in our sequence of lectures and today إن شاء الله we'll speak about the play and prospect evaluation we'll talk about the trail as well uh, طبعا this is my lecture my last lecture in this sequence the petroleum uh, system uh, um, you know evaluation uh, so I take the opportunity to thank Abdul Munam Zakwani for the, all the arrangement uh, he did from uh, GSOSI. Inshallah, I meet you again in August, whereby we do another one, another session, similar to this one, a workshop in mining. So uh, today I'm going to go through, first of all, uh, just to remind you, we had three, uh, we're, we're having three lectures. So we already completed lecture number one, which was uh, an overview of of the petroleum system of Oman, then we had lecture number two, which, which was basically about the geophysical data and seismic interpretation. And today we'll complete, inshallah, lecture number three, which is about play and prospect evaluation. And for lecture number two, yeah, we couldn't finish all the slides. Um, so I'm just going to go a quick revision on these slides, and then I'll explain four or five uh, concepts that I actually have not covered uh, previously. And then, so quickly go to lecture number uh, two. Uh, I put the slides uh, full screen. And uh, so last, so basically after I finish these three lectures, there will be a lecture next week, inshallah, on Sunday by Dr. Talal Awlaqi, and then three other lectures on the, two other lectures on the same, same week, next week, and then a lecture the week after. So last uh, session or last lecture we had, we talked about uh, various exploration techniques. So we spoke about uh, gravity, magnetic, seismic, and the importance of these, and why we need to have gravity and magnetic in the beginning uh, together, uh, especially when we have large basins, when we cannot cover the whole area by uh, seismic, we usually use gravity and magnetic as a cheaper option, yeah? compared to seismic, in order to evaluate what, what lies below the surface, you know. And we do that not only for uh, um, petroleum, but we also do it for uh, exploration of mining or minerals. And in mining, we also add other things, other uh, uh, geophysical and, uh, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, remote sensing, s sensing uh, techniques. Uh, and we said that uh, there are various types about uh, things about seismic we need to know. One of them is the reflection coefficient, which is the ability of a certain boundary between two layers to reflect seismic data. And the, the more there is contrast between two layers, the more there is likelihood we'll be able to uh, image that reflection of our boundary in, in good details in our seismic data. That's why in South Oman, for instance, the Haima and how she is sequence is not very well imaged because the contrast or acoustic impedance between the layers there is not as good as what we see in North Oman in the reservoirs in North Oman, whereby we have a huge contrast or a big contrast between the layering uh, there. And we spoke about the means of acquiring seismic on land, on offshore, and we also uh, sp uh, spoke uh, briefly about seismic processing, migration, uh, stacking, deconvolution, which basically removes what's so-called multiples. And multiples is uh, when you have basically uh, uh, ref reflections of seismic, uh, you know, reflect reflected multiple times through a certain layer. So you have the same layer reappearing in your seismic a number of times, and sometimes they can cover the original uh, seismic reflections and may lead to misinterpretation of the seismic data, but now the processing techniques nowadays, they've improved significantly, so they can actually remove these uh, effects. We spoke about uh, synthetic seismic, and we said in synthetic seismic is a, is a very beautiful tool. Why? Because it utilizes uh, uh, log data from wells to create uh, what we call synthetic, so not really very true, uh, seismic, so it's a, it's a made seismic. It's something that we produced ourselves from well data. So we use the sonic log to estimate velocity. We uh, use density uh, log. We multiply these two 
to represent reflection coefficient because reflection coefficient is basically um, velocity multiplied by density. And then we apply to these certain wavelets, and from that certain wavelets, we make what's so called synthetic seismic, which we can then display in a similar display as we see in the in the seismic uh, data. And then by doing so, and I use Petrail, this is not exactly synthetic seismic, but last time, if you remember, I, I presented in Petrail that in some cases, if the synthetic seismic is really looking good, then we can display it in our well data and compare it directly to our seismic data. What is the beauty of that? The beauty of that is that we can say, for instance, if we have the well tops of a certain formation, say this blue, blue, blue layer here, let's say this is top garif, we will be able to, if, if, the, if the synthetic seismic is showing the same reflections at we, as we, what we see in true seismic, we can tell from the synthetic seismic that we know for sure this is top garif. Why? Because in the real seismic, we cannot do that. However, in the well data, we can because we have well tops. We know when we penetrate, penetrated top garif, for instance, at our well location. And this is very beautiful because it tells you um, what what kind of signature that well top has in your seismic data? It gives you trust in your uh, uh, you know interpretation. It also gives you direct time to depth relationship, which is really very beautiful because you you then can use this data to convert the whole seismic cube in your area. So synthetic seismic, if they work, they can be very good. And we also spoke about well seismic, and well seismic is basically the ability to acquire. Um, seismic uh, along the borehole, and we have different uh, ways to do that, uh, either placing our receivers in the well bore or uh, uh, shooting our seismic from the surface, or otherwise placing our well bores in one well and then having the si receivers on the other well. So we have well-to-well -well, uh, seismic, that's what we call, and this will be very good to image the area between these two wells. So in one well, we put the receivers and and then we use uh, a source of seismic on the other one. In fact, we can sometimes use the, uh, what do you call it, the coring bit of, of the other well as a source for uh, seismic uh, signals. Uh, if the spacing between the receivers where we acquire a time depth relationship is not big, we, we then can make vertical seismic profiles. So we can make a seismic profile across our well board. If not, then we call it something called check shot data. And check shot data, you can see the name here. Very beautiful. Why? Because you you get from them. So basically, you get MD is, you can think of it as depth or measured depth. And two-way time is the, uh, the basically time for the seismic to go down and return. So two-way time. It, you can get, get a straight relationship between depth and time from check shot data. Therefore, you can get average velocity and interval velocity of the layers in between. And then you use this velocity to depth convert your seismic data. So check shot data is one of the techniques that you can use to depth convert your seismic data. And it's very useful because you can actually QC your, uh, you know, your uh, uh, differences on the technique. So what you do here in Petrail, let me just show you, since we are speaking about this anyway, let me show you how to do it in Petrail. So you will, you will go, for instance, on seismic interpretation workflow. Okay. And then you go to, uh, there should be somewhere here. Unfortunately, it's not open now. Uh, you go here on uh, velocity modeling, which I don't see, unfortunately. Anyway, it's probably not allowed here in this, uh, in this uh, uh, session. But anyways, you get here into a petrail, very straightforward. You basically put your uh, average velocities, for instance, and you put um, your certain surface that you want to convert. And, uh, or you can otherwise, so that's, that's one way to do it. Or otherwise, you can also use that check shot data. Uh, maybe I can actually, maybe I have it here. No, I don't. But anyway, you can, you can use that data, uh, what do you call it, check shot data, in order to create a, a depth uh, time seismic cube, a cube of velocities. And when you create that cube, then you can use that cube basically to 
uh, model your so these are the check shot data there i show it in big uh, what do you call it big uh, uh, circles and uh, you can see that the velocity uh, quite uniformly increase as we go with depth so you can use this data to create a cube of velocities with average velocities for instance in order for you to uh, do depth to time uh, conversion Okay, so that's uh, that's just about check shot data, which are very important for geologists and geophysicists uh, to know. Uh, then we, uh, okay, so I have to go full screen. Then we spoke about seismic resolution, and we said seismic resolution at best is, is around 10 meters or above 10 meters. Therefore, anything up below that seismic cannot see. And we said that uh, resolution of seismic, well, the very good thing about seismic is coverage. So a well can only see at its low own location and everything away from the well is just prediction. Whereas in seismic, it images at a large scale. However, the res vertical resolution is unfortunately uh, not as good. Uh, nevertheless, people obviously use different methods to enhance and extract different data from seismic quality. Uh, and we spoke about when you have 3D seismic cube, you can slice it, slice it the way you want. You can make random lines, in lines, uh, cross lines, time slices. And I think last time I did show you in how to do that in Petrail. So you can display seismic data the way you want. You can also play the seismic. So you, if you want to basically make the seismic data move, mo moving and you interpret, see the seismic, how it, how it uh, works basically, you can see the faults, beautiful faults. You can image them and you move the seismic and interpret one seismic next to, uh, to the other until you complete the whole uh, cube. You, in fact, in Petrail, you can also ask the software to pick up the, uh, the 3D uh, surfaces for you. And this is now very common in many software. Uh, OK, uh, so, and so when you get to that, then uh, so this is the, basically the integrated workflow of seismic interpretation. You do seismic cube, uh, uh, time slices, in lines, cross lines, random. Usually, you choose your seismic interpretation to do to be uh, parallel or perpendicular to certain uh, structural uh, or geological features. So, if you have certain faults running, for instance, northeast, southwest, you probably want to slice your seismic, make it run uh, against the fault, or fault orientation, so that you basically are able to see the faults at their uh, true dip, right? Uh, then you, you do uh, world to seismic calibration, and this is very important and can be very revealing in terms of understanding quality of that seismic. You create a velocity cube. Uh, you may do that before uh, your seismic interpretation or after. So if you want to depth, uh, if you want to interpret your on your depth cube, the one that you've already converted, you do your velocity modeling, either using processing velocities. I'll get to that now, or check shot data, or what some, something also called pseudo velocities. I'll also speak about it now. Uh, so you create that, you make your depth cube, and then you interpret it, okay? Or otherwise, you interpret it on your seismic, on your uh, time domain, seismic, uh, which I personally prefer, okay? And then you depth convert your horizons and folds in order to make your uh, surfaces. And once you make your surfaces, so let's say, for instance, I have a certain reservoir I'm interested at, uh, say, uh, upper gully, right? So I make a, a, a top, I remove the seismic inter interpretation from here. So this is a surface with a big fault. You can see here, I'll just make it at uh, one to one scale. You can see here a, full, uh, a surface that we made here for this one of the fields in Oman. And you can see how the the field is actually cut by a number of, uh, what do you call it, uh, folds. Uh, and you can see the number of, of wells that cross cut uh, or, or, or are penetrating this uh, surface. So this kind of thing, you arrive after uh, a loop of or, or iterations of seismic interpretation, uh, including horizon uh, interpretation, fault interpretation, uh, velocity modeling, and depth to si uh, time to depth conversion. Among the most important thing to realize in your seismic interpretation is vertical exaggeration. So sometimes the the the, the seismic is 
heavily vertically exaggerated. Sometimes it's not. Uh, you need to realize that. Most people, when they interpret the seismic, they put it, so, so say, say, for instance, this is the true uh, representation of seismic, one to one. So every one kilometer vertically representing the same dimension on the horizontal side. People do not normally prefer to do that, interpret seismic at one to one scale. They like to exaggerate it on the vertical sense. And then, in Arabic, uh, why? Because uh, they do this because then you can actually see the faults much better and you can see all the horizons much better than if you do one to one. So, if I change this to one to one, you can see that, you know, the, the let's say the, the quality of, of display of seismic, uh, you know, reduces. Um, you need to realize that when you interpret faults, because for instance, normally normal faults, they dip at 90 degrees, uh, sorry, 60 degrees. Strike slip faults, they dip close to 90 degrees. Uh, re reverse faults, they normally uh, dip around 45 degrees, unless, or less actually, unless they are inverted from other faults. Uh, so keeping that in mind is very important because you don't want to interpret a normal fault which is dipping at 20 degrees, for instance, unless it is a list a listric fault. So this kind of things you need to realize if you have a high vertical exaggeration. Uh, seismic inversion is another very interesting actually tool that you can use. Seismic in inversion is just the other way of seismic. So seismic is that we use our uh, reflection uh, coefficient that we receive from from the underground to create seismic data, right? Uh, which we interpret then to represent the subsurface. Seismic inversions is to do, to invert the process. So try to use the seismic data to make for us a model of the subsurface. So try to use that seismic cube to represent the subsurface for us in all terms, in terms of porosity, for instance, in terms of, uh, you know, reservoir pro properties in general, in terms of change of these reservoir properties as well. How do we do that? We use the, um, uh, let's say, the change of uh, reflection coefficient at the various unit boundaries to understand uh, the wavelet amplitude and phase, okay? So we try to understand this reflection or this change of lithology, what does it respond to in, in, in nature, okay? Um, and then when we are, once we, 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 once we become able to uh, figure out uh, that, you know, the, the characteristics of this wavelet, we can then use this, this understanding to present true nature, okay, or, or reservoir properties. So therefore, we extract these various wavelets from the, truth, from the seismic cube, and we apply to them these various uh, properties that we've figured out, incorporating really all the data, world data that we have, as well as the seismic data we have, including attributes, seismic attributes, or all other data. So the beauty of seismic inversion is that we will use our seismic cube to make a reservoir model for us to represent the subsurface for us. However, in many cases, uh, and it's, you know, it's trial and error, and it sometimes it's, it's, it's a tedious process. If, if the, all the data are perfect, uh, the uh, seismic quality is very good, it can be done in, in a few days. But if it's not, then it may take weeks or even months to be able to produce something sensible out of this. Uh, it's very good, but in, unfortunately not very successful in, uh, because of the quality of data. In South Oman, for instance, it usually doesn't uh, work. 4D seismic, I'll, I'll explain it in the next slide. 4D seismic is also very beautiful, very nice tool. Uh, and if uh, it works usually with uh, reservoirs that change uh, fluid phase. For instance, if we are injecting a lot of hot steam or hot gas in a certain reservoir, uh, the amplitude uh, of the seismic will be reduced. Why? Because then gas is replacing fluids, replacing uh, water and, uh, and, and oil, uh, if there is oil in the reservoir. And therefore, uh, we are actually reducing, kind of reducing the, dense, the uh, overall density of the rock fluid package. And therefore, because of that reduction in amplitude, we can image that or see it 
uh, in our seismic data. So what you do here for the seismic, so three, we're moving here from 3D to 4D. So we're adding the element of time here. So we're shooting the seismic data with the same parameters, with the same uh, uh, setting, okay, acquisition setting in the same place. And in many cases, we just leave our geophones uh, buried or, or left there at the field location. And we come again and shoot the seismic every so often to acquire the data and try to understand uh, what kind of phases has uh, you know been changed in our reservoir. Why do we do that? We do that because we then can optimize our development of reservoir. We will be able to, to see where are the places where gas injection has been successful and we managed to produce the oil from the reservoir. And therefore now gas is replacing the oil in that place. We will be able to say, for instance, there is this place here where oil has still not been you know, uh, drained and therefore we need to uh, put another well here to produce the oil. We will be able to see how the contact in this case is changing. So it's lowering in this place, okay? Because gas is basically working, you can think of it as a, a piston push, pushing the oil water contact uh, down. Uh, so beautiful tool, again, it doesn't always work and it is very costly. So you won't do it un unless you have, you know, a reservoir that would make a good return for its uh, development. And also usually, as I said, you do it when you think that the amplitude significantly change uh, uh, because of production or because of development injection. Seismic attributes, it's, um, it's the process whereby we try to create various types of um, extraction or properties from our seismic data, including for instance, instance discontinuities in seismic data, change of uh, reflectivity of that seismic, change of uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, amplitude uh, over uh, distance, you know, you know, and uh, so various types, coherency, curvature, all sorts of things. We can do loads of attributes that software can do nowadays. Um, and from this, we can actually see faults much better. We can see, um, you know, we can see also channels. If we have, uh, for instance, carbonate channels or fluvial channels, sometimes they may appear beautifully in this seismic attribute. Uh, direct hydrocarbon indicators, they're also very beautiful if you actually can see them. In Oman, I'm aware of a few of them has been seen uh, offshore and onshore um, in some reservoirs. They usually are uh, more prominent when you have gas oil contact. Why? Because the place where you, where you have gas, so if you have gas here, say this is a trap, right? A fault trap apparently. Um, you have here gas, and therefore the overall density of this package is different from the surrounding rocks. Yeah, because gas with uh, they, that package would have uh, less density uh, than compared to uh, if the rocks were filled up by water, for instance. And therefore, you, what you will see, you will see a, cont uh, a flat uh, kind of uh, surface or line here that marks this change of density. So this itself, it will work as a reflection, okay? That separates between uh, uh, the, the gas-filled part of the structure and the water-filled part of the structure. And therefore, you can actually see, uh, what do you call it, the, the uh, you know, the fluids or the hydrocarbon directly into your seismic data. Uh, this is my last slide on the seismic uh, data. And here, we are, so basically this is a whole a big story and we use, I used to run a course on depth to ta, ta, uh, time to depth conversion take it used to take two days and people have always complained that the course is very short so the story here is very complex to do time to depth conversion um, and some people experienced more experienced people they may uh, take weeks to explain the whole story in details the idea here, in order we acquire seismic in time, but we want to uh, model our reservoir in depth, obviously, because that's how we drill our wells and that's how we develop our reservoir, yeah? So we need to know our uh, subsurface picture in depth. So how do we convert uh, seismic from time to depth? Um, we, we convert it using different ways. One of them is called V0K, whereby we uh, assume um, a constant change of velocity with depth. And usually usually we relate that 
to compaction, okay? Uh, and this is a straightforward way. It works very well when you have kind of homogeneous change of velocity with depth, okay? So you start with some initial velocity and then you increase it as you go down. And sometimes it works, especially for regional data. And it's also very easy to apply. Therefore, many companies apply it when there is a lack of data. There is sonic logs, whereby you can have an idea about velocities as well. And then you use these velocities to uh, uh, depth convert your size, type seismic cube. Check shot data, I already explained. VSP, I also explained vertical seismic profiles. You can think of these to be similar to check shot, but with higher resolution. This one is, uh, and let me just explain this one, the seismic data. So seismic data uh, conversion is basically the data which is uh, revealed or obtained from the processing of seismic. When we tried, for instance, to migrate the seismic data in order or stack it in order to have good imaging of the subsurface, we use velocities in our uh, trial and error um, you know, loops in order to get, get big, good picture from the seismic, uh, from, from the seismic of, of the subsurface. Uh, so we, we get from these processes uh, velocities. We call these processing velocities or seismic uh, velocities. Usually they are very good or they are good, but they, they often uh, create uh, substantial mismatches at the field locations. Therefore, I, I tend to use them to know the trends of velocities because they, they cover a large area. So you want to see where the velocity is increasing in a certain direction or decreasing in another di direction. I use uh, normally seismic velocities to see these trends. The one I left is pseudo velocities or interpretation velocities. This is simple, it's tricky, it's quite dangerous, but most people use it because it's quite easy. So what you do here, I'll explain it in very simple terms. So what you do here uh, is quite simple. Uh, so you go, I go to Petrel for instance. Say I have in Petrel here, I'll just take one of the wells. Okay. Uh, say I have one of these wells here in, 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 uh, in Petrel. So I know this one, for instance, I know this one is top, say this is top natty, okay? I know this from experience that this reflection is from top Nati and also from other wells in the area. And I'm very experienced seismologist, for instance, you know. So I'm, I'm, I trust my experience. I know this reflection is for top Nati, for instance. So what I do here, I interpret top Nati at this location. And because I have, uh, I know here that this is my top Nati at certain depth on the well, okay? So I have the well. And I can see the reflection of this on seismic. I have time information from my seismic, and I have depth from my well. Okay, I, I don't know if you got that. So I create time depth relationship from my interpretation because I'm interpreting the seismic. I know this is top natty. Therefore, at this level, I'm expecting to see it. Okay, or this is the reflection um, I know for for the natty. So I I make that relationship. Okay, time depth, and then I use this relationship to uh, to depth convert my si time seismic data. Again, I'm making it very simple, uh, but usually it takes a lot of time to explain. Now I'm going to move, so I'm, uh, I'm just going to have a quick look at the... Uh, uh, okay, so people putting some comments here. Somebody is saying, Mafi Sot. Anyways, I'll just jump to the second uh, lecture. Uh, so lecture number three. Now we're talk about play and prospect evaluation. And last time I did speak about plays and prospects and the difference about them. So a play is basically a petroleum system where all, where, where all the ingredients are working, or we hope they work, so traps, reservoirs, seals, timing, migration, uh, preservation, all these elements are all present in that certain place. And therefore, we think that we might, might find a lot of structures, a lot of places whereby we can drill and find oil. And these structures that we drill are called, are called prospects, okay? So the prospects are the in individual. Now say I'm looking at this seismic, data, okay, and let me just for, for the sake of explanation, I'll put a, a, a Z, 
uh, a time slice on this. Uh, now, we know that the, a lot of the structures are rounded in shape, okay, the hymapods in this area, they represent, let's say, anticlines, uh, in essence, but they're not exactly anticlines or compres uh, compressional structures, but just for, for the sake of argument. So all of these are hymapods or, or uh, rounded structures. So let's say, assume we, we know that this is a working petroleum system. We have a source rock. We have a reservoir, we have a trap, we have migration, and so forth. So we know here that we do have working petroleum system. Every single one of these is a prospect that we go and drill. And you can see here that we've drilled this prospect, we drilled this prospect, we drilled this prospect, prospect, another prospect. Maybe this one is still not drilled. Maybe we need to go and tell the company, go and drill this one. Maybe this one is still not drilled. We, know, we need to go and tell the company still. And, and by the way, when I, I pr presented to you in the first lecture, in the eastern flank of Oman, there are a huge number of prospects. And I was telling you last time that there were funny names, actually, of these, uh, some of these prospects here. So here, for inst instance, this is uh, Marmul. And then here, all of these are fields that continue all the way from Marmul to Mkhezna. Probably Mkhezna will be somewhere here. So oh, there is a huge number of clusters here. And I was telling you that there are even funny names of prospects named here. Like, I remember uh, two of the names were uh, Arnab and Jazara, okay? And there are other names. I remember one of the seismologists was naming uh, some of the prospects after his uh, children. Taban, what, if they were discovered, then they would probably receive different names. Like in, because there are really many uh, prospects in the area, you know, people start to introduce some funny names sometimes. Uh, petroleum system uh, framework, so we try to make a full understanding of the petroleum system, including the rocks, including the fluids, and then try to uh, understand uh, uh, the concept behind it and compare it to other places in our basin or uh, in our in worldwide in order to basically decide whether we should drill this one or not, whether it's economic or not. Uh, we spoke about the petroleum system a long time ago. Let me just, uh, I'll jump to this one because I didn't explain it last time uh, thoroughly. So here, uh, this is uh, depth, right? So depth in kilometers, this is 60 degrees. So assuming here the geothermal gradient, saying say it increases here roughly by uh, 30 degrees every one kilometer and the temperature at surface is around 30 degrees. So here, after one kilometer or so, we get to 60 degrees, and then after three and a half kilometers, we get to 120 degrees, okay? Uh, so in this case, uh, this is the oil window, whereby the source rock, they start to expel oil, okay? They start to generate oil, because of temperature, because of pressure, because of, um, you know, either biogenic processes, they start to, and that's what we call catagenesis. And here you expel oil at a cer certain depth. Obviously, if the geothermal gradient is lower than this, then you expect this window to be deeper. If it's uh, higher, then it, you expect this window to be higher, or shallower, sorry. So here, this is the gas window, this is the oil. So here, if you go very deep into your basin or play, you don't expect to find any more oil, because uh, the chain, will not, uh, the, the temperature will not allow to have a complex change of hydrocarbons, and usually you break that uh, chemical bound of the carbon atoms in order to form lighter ones. Therefore, you have gas. You have gas instead of uh, fluid. We have migration, where the oil migrates from the source rocks into sometimes a motile structure. So this is the primary migration. Uh, so this is the primary migration uh, from the expulsion of oil from the source rock. Uh, it's uh, migration to the, the carrier rock and charging is called uh, secondary. Sometimes this happens twice. And th this migration in, is when you lose the, your oil. So it, it, it leaves because the seal in this co ca case is uh, broken or uh, maybe because um, uh, you have significant weathering, right? So in all cases, or you have a fault, 
you lose your oil to the surface. And this has happened in many places in Oman. In fact, in Oman, we have a lot of source rocks and they have produced a lot of or generated a lot of oil over the years. But we most likely have lo lost this because of our tech, uh, uh, complex tectonic uh, activities. In Oman, we have um, seeps, oil seeps, okay, in a number of places in Oman. Uh, the most famous one is in Mahout area. Uh, and this was discovered back in 1956 or 57 when the IPC, Iraq Petroleum Company, was making uh, exploration of oil in Oman by some, you know, a very uh, guru or, or big uh, experienced uh, geologists. Uh, there are different types of traps, so I'm just going through this for just background information. Otherwise, I, I think most of you know this. We have structural traps like anticlines, domes, uh, sags against salt, uh, against faults as well. We have stratigraphic traps like pinch outs, reefs, build ups, unconformities, uh, on laps, uh, lenses, uh, uh, fasces, change of fasces, like for instance, we explained in the first, first lecture something called clinoforms, this kind of stratigraphic traps. Most of the traps, obviously, and the most the ones that have low risk usually or lower risk are the structural uh, traps. So for exploration, we normally do a number of things. We do global understanding of our basin, so basin evaluation, okay? We try to understand our basin, all the concepts, uh, geological concepts of deposition, of tectonic history, of uh, uh, thermal, uh, you know, uh, or maturation that had happened in the basin, the burial history of it, um, um, the change of fasces, and so on. In broad sense, we do that as a, as a first step. And then we develop our play concepts. We try to identify places within that basin where petroleum is likely to occur, petroleum system likely to uh, be present. And once we do that, we define our exploration uh, play area. So we say then, this is our play area. We want to focus in this area, okay? And we start to do proper mapping of, of uh, horizons and folds, and we start to identify within a certain play prospects, okay? And then we do rank these prospects, okay? So we, we say, for instance, there is a chance of 50% we will find a reservoir here. We have a chance of 70% we have a source of, we have 70% chance of having so seal, and then we rank all these prospects. The prospects that have higher chance and bigger volume will rank higher. Okay, the ones that have uh, low chance or uh, high risk and uh, low volumes will uh, rank lower. So then we, we we look at our economics, we look at our chances, and then we start to put um, a drilling program of exploration or exploring these prospects, and we start. Then we start. Uh, to, to drill our uh, wells. Uh, if we find a new play, everybody is happy. That means there could be many, new, numerous number, number of uh, prospects, uh, of, of prospects uh, that can be found in that area. So this is the loop, how it's done. We do the play concept. We try to understand our source rocks, reservoirs, traps, time, timing, migration. We then try to assess the risk related to that and the volumes, okay? So the risks of source rocks, risks of finding reservoir, risk of trap, and it's assessment, okay? It's qualitative assessment normally. Uh, um, and we do that risking and also we do estimation of volumetrics. And once we do that, we then do our economic analysis to see, uh, you know, uh, try to image broadly our cash flow and value measures of, of this uh, prospect or display and once we do that we then move into engineering so we add to it all these uh, engineering aspects of how to drill these uh, 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 you know uh, prospects how we are going to develop them in future so we try even to have a picture of of these for futures costs you know it might be a very small um, uh, high risky uh, prospect that may require a huge cost of development. We don't want to go for that one. And once we do that, we go for a decision to drill it. And once we drill it, we then review that post-drill uh, outcomes. 
and we see where the successes are and where the failures are and we try to avoid them in future. However, although it's a loop that it takes you know, various types of uh, disciplines, the core uh, business in this is geology, geological uncertainties. That's why in exploration, usually are geoscientists who take, uh, let's say, lead into decisions, okay? And uh, companies, big companies, I give example here of PDO, uh, usually exploration department in PDO is led by a, a geoscientist. Whereas if you go to the development de departments, they often led by engineers. Because in development, uh, it is supposed, supposed that geolo geology, geological uncertainties are reduced, and uh, it's a matter of how we develop the optimum means of engineering that we develop our reservoir. But in reality, obviously, geological uncertainties, they pursue, they continue throughout the field life, right from the beginning, exploration, all the way until abandonment of the field. Uh, this is one of the beautiful charts we do. Uh, this chart is what so called timing uh, risk chart. Hereby, we put all the various ingredients on a chart versus time, and we try to see when the source rock was deposited, when was this reservoir, reservoir rocks deposited, the sealed rocks deposited, the trap was formed, when was the oil uh, generated and migrated, and uh, whether it's preserved up to date or not. And obviously it's very important because if you have your source rocks, for instance, deposited after your reservoir, it won't make sense unless, because the source rock would be above your reservoir, unless you have what we call in geology juxtaposition created because of faulting, and therefore you have the source rock, in this case, sitting against your reservoir. So you need to, uh, this time chart is very good because you need to have a proper setting. Also, you need to have your seal rock uh, normally after your reservoir, so capping your reservoir <coughs> in order for you to have a working petroleum system. However, obviously in complex areas where you have a lot of faults and so on, the story might be more complex and the, the uh, uh, let's say the, the chart, the uh, uh, chances whereby you have petroleum, working petroleum system can be changed. Uh, the picture of the chart can be changed. Uh, risk assessment, another very interesting process. Here we do multiply various, uh, uh, you know, um, elements uh, of the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, petroleum system with their risk. So we, we multiply the prob probability of source, probability of reservoir, probability of trap, and even dynamic properties of the reservoir we multiply them uh, uh, one by another to get what we, we call geological success. So say, for instance, everything here is 100%, or it's never 100, let's say 90%. So reservoir is 90% probability, we have it. Trap is 90% dynamic properties or probabilities are high as well. But the source rock, we have only 10%. If you do the multiplication, your geological success would be uh, significantly lowered and uh, deteriorated because of source rock. So every single element of this is crucial to make your probability, geological success probability working, okay? So this, it, it, it shows you how important it is to have all the ingredients uh, working. And for each ingredient, you need to check various things. So source rocks, its thickness is important. You can cannot rely on a very thin uh, layer of tight limestone, for instance, to be your seal. If you have a very thick uh, layer of shale or salt, then that is perfect seal. You can rely on it. It's unlikely that you have the oil uh, migrating across that or is re uh, dismigrating against that. Um, continuity is very important. You cannot have your source. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm explaining about seal now, but you cannot have your seal, for instance, patchy as well. Source rock, say likewise, both for thickness and continuity. Uh, reservoir is also very important. You need to have sufficient porosity permeability to rely on. Uh, sometimes you may also rely on fractures for your production if the reservoir is very tight. 
Uh, source rock maturity is very important. You uh, try to see the maximum uh, thermal uh, maturation that reservoir uh, went uh, to. You want to also to see uh, the TOC content of your uh, reservoir. So you determine all these factors together in order to be able to say whether your source rocks is going to work or not. Your trap again, various factors here. Again, the structure trap is usually the best. Um, seal, as I said, thickness, continuity is likewise important, just as source rocks. Timing is very important. Everything needs to be working. Migration needs to. So all these are uh, checklists that you need to go through. And I just captured them from this very interesting paper. So you might actually Google this paper about the about risking petroleum system. It's, it's an AAPG paper that I read years ago, and it's very useful on this sense. Again, from the same paper, you can see various types of, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, exploration fronts. So here you have evaluation whereby the risk is low, actually. So you are working in the same play, adjacent, adjacent uh, structure. So for instance, you go to Marmoon, and you say, okay, I know that there is oil in Marmoon, okay, it produces, and I know how I have working petroleum system. I want now to go and explore this one, okay? This should be low risk, okay, because there is a petroleum system next to it, so why not? Why is this not charged? Like this one, it's one of the structures where companies have tried to drill a number of times, unfortunately, it is dry. Uh, why is it dry? Nobody understood understand until today why it is dry but you know there must be a reason behind it so people try to explain it anyways whenever you are exploring around your same area uh, in your uh, play uh, next to your fields it's low risk however if i decide and go and explore for instance in this area here in Oman, where by there are no fields producing and uh, uh, probably no boreholes exist as well you know uh, maybe a few of them so here this is a frontier exploration, whereby you're going beyond your boundaries knowledge and you try to assess a new petroleum system that nobody has explored properly in the past. So that's what we call frontier exploration. And usually with the frontier exploration, you have very high risk. So you can see that your geological probability, geological success probability is less than 5%, okay? Or on average is around 5%, which is very low. But companies still go for this, especially big companies. Why? Because if they work, then you make a huge uh, profit. Uh, usually, you will find a new play. You might even find a new basin. Um, and that will return a big uh, uh, prize for, for your company and for your uh, country as well. Um, so that's basically the way uh, assessment normally works, obviously. Company, different companies different, do it different ways, but this is, let's say, this is the, uh, what do you say, this is the logic behind it normally. Uh, probability, then we put the probability in a curve, both in, uh, let's say, exploration and in production using a STOIP formula. So we have, uh, let's say, the what's so called the, uh, the volume, okay? So the bulk volume of the rocks, so the area multiplied by the thickness, you have the net to gross, and net to gross is usually, let's say, the amount of reservoir in a certain package, okay? Usually is used for uh, plastic reservoir, but it can all also be used for carbonate reservoir. You have porosity, hydrocarbon saturation, divided by the formation volume uh, factor. So you, you measure your stoip for various probabilities, okay? So you create various scenarios of probabilities. Let's say, for instance, my porosity is either 25% high case, 20% mid case, and then low case 15%. I have three cases of porosity. Then, for instance, I have three cases for saturation. Average saturation, 80%, 70%, 60%. And then I have another, let's say, three cases of, of say, st structure, high structure, medium structure, and low structure. And then I have three cases of net to growth, and so forth, right? So I have three cases of four parameters, for instance. So I need to multiply in a de deterministic way every single parameter of these four variables against the other variable. And in this case, I'll need to multiply three by three by three 
by 3, okay, which will end up to be 81. I'm, I'm just calculating now uh, very quickly, so that might not be exact. Anyway, I think it's 81. So you will have 81 variables in your list, and then every one of them will have a number of stoic. You just plot them in your curve, and you can see these curves. You can display them in this cumulative probabilities, or in this one, and uh, you can see the distribution of possibilities. Usually companies use low case in many cases when they want to develop the reservoirs in their economics, because that's what your pro proven case is. So your low case, okay, is usually your proven reserve, and we usually use 90%. So when we come here, this is 100%. This is usually, this is 85%, roughly speaking. So most companies use 90%. So here, this value here would be my low case. This value here, 10%. This is now 15%, but here will be my 10%, for instance. I can also use the cumulative probability, will be my high, high case, and the mid case would be midway between these two. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the mid case or the base case is probably more into the low case or the high case, depends on the your uncertainties. The, so this is proven reserves, low case. This is proven and probable, 2P, and that's usually around 50%, so base case, and then proven, probable, and possible, Possible, we hope it exists, but it's unlikely, is your high case, what we call 3P. And this is normally done for uh, petroleum, it's done for mining, it's also done for other business. And why we do that? We, uh, for investment pur purposes, uh, we do that so that uh, usually we do not report these numbers. The high case is not reported. It's a high case. If it exists, it's well and good. If it doesn't, we have planned for the low case, and we're hoping at least for the base case. Interestingly, however, for most reservoirs, uh, after we drill and we develop them, <laughs> develop them, we find the uh, the stoop, the the actual stoop in the reservoir outside the low case and high and high case range. So it's either lower than the lower case or higher than the higher case. Unfortunately, this is true uh, for different uh, business types, and um, you know, obviously, you would need to reduce your uh, what you call it geological uncertainties in our business in order for you to produce something reliable. Uh, I'm getting to the end of uh, uh, the lecture, so that's good. It will give us another five times to go to Petrail. Uh, I have two slides here, probably two, I think, uh, or three, four, in fact, more. <laughs> Anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll skip some slides. So the idea here, once you do your horizons, your calls, uh, you prove that there is a reservoir, you drilled it, you ex explored it, you, you pr produced the reservoir, you do booking, so now that goes into your economic uh, books, okay? And uh, you, 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 you move your reservoir or field from, from exploration to production, where uh, people, geologists in production or in, the, in study centers, okay, or, or development centers, they make static models. And static models are beautiful representation of the subsurface. I can show you an example of... Uh, let me just undisplay the seismic from here. Oops. Okay. Uh, let me just display uh, undisplay the seismic for some some reason. It's not undisplaying. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, if I go to this reservoir. Okay. Uh, we can produce uh, what do you call it as. Um, as uh, a model of it, either porosity, permeability, whichever, okay, uh, using all the parameters. So let me show you the net to gross, for, for instance, for this reservoir. Ho hopefully, it displays well, because this is an old model. Uh, oh, no, sorry, it doesn't, unfortunately. Maybe I can show the zones at least. Not even the zones, unfortunately. So sorry for this. Porosity, can I show the porosity? Anyways, I cannot show the model. Apparently, it's not very active for some reason. Uh, maybe the window also has a problem. So if I open a new window, say 3D window, 3D window. So shoot. Apparently, I opened a new type of window. Okay, 3D window, again, porosity. 
Unfortunately, it's not showing. So it must be a, a problem in the model I'm using. Uh, anyways, so you build up a model, and uh, this is how the model will look like, and it will include within it porosity, permeability, net to growth, all the all saturation, all the properties you want to mo model, also fractures. And then you give this, this model to your re reservoir engineer, who will then use that model to simulate the fluids in your reservoir. So, uh, you know, oil, uh, gas, uh, and water, uh, what, whatever you have as fluids there, will try to simulate it using various software. So one of, one of the important messages about models is that they are not, by default, models are not true, okay? They are images that we, we make in order for us to develop our reservoirs in petroleum industry, okay? So they do, they do not, in reality, represent nature perfectly. They actually have a lot of defects within them, and we need to always realize these defects. Also, when we make a model, we need to realize that many people integrate data into it, and we need to make data assurance, and we need to work in a good working environment so that all people feel they are part of this model, and therefore they do their best to make it as good as possible. So there is no my model or your model. There is our model when you work in a team, right? So you try to, to, to have that. Um, so I'll, I'll jump through these slides uh, now. So in summary, we have geophysicists, geophysicist making the surfaces and faults. We have a geologist who makes the model, and then a reservoir engineer who makes fluids and so on. One of the important things are conceptual models. So we try to understand the structure of geology. We make concepts out of that so that we make realistic model of nature based on our understanding. If our understanding is wrong, the model is more wrong, yeah? Uh, if our understanding is proper, the model is less wrong. Let's put it this way. So uh, we really need to have the right concepts, the geological concept, in order to build a, a meaningful uh, model. Um, I won't take this one, but uh, for this, we do upscaling. So we take all the logs, assumingly this is porosity, we make upscaling. So we try to make uh, certain layers or zones or blocks that will model the porosity in uh, certain, uh, uh, you know, grid. Uh, so, for instance, one meter by one meter, for the sorry, one meter on the vertical sense, and then maybe 50 by 50 meters on the x and y. I think I can jump these slides. They're not very important, but uh, one of the important things to talk about are fractures. So, fractures are very important, especially for carbonate reservoirs, and in many cases, we need to model them explicitly capture them explicitly explicitly into our model uh, i think we're done uh, we still have uh, three minutes uh, so I, i'll just take maybe one question here from fatima she's saying do you think that the oil will expire soon i think i said this in our first uh, lecture as long as we are thinking and bringing new methods oil is always there in the underground and we have been seeing uh, since centuries, in fact, since the 1920s or 30s, when the oil started to be produced from the last uh, century, uh, we were saying that, uh, what do you call it, oil is going to fi finish or end, but that's not right. There are always new techniques. Uh, anyways, ladies and gents, I think we are done with the lecture. It's about 10 o'clock. If you have any questions, please uh, put them down so we can answer them in the next five minutes. Otherwise, we will uh, stop. Yes, please, uh, uh, go on, feel free to ask. I still don't uh, see any questions. Anyway, if uh, apparently there are 
Not many uh, coming. I'll just wait for a minute or so. Uh, so I take your question, why not continue drill by PDO as notional? I guess you mean the national company. Uh, well, PDO is as an agreement, obviously is, uh, uh, is uh, a joint venture, and uh, its mandate is to produce oil from Oman, and then various companies sell it. And these companies which are part of the joint venture, then they have to pay, you know, various... Uh, types of taxes to the government. Uh, one of the good things about PDO, uh, although it has 60% for government and 40% for other companies, Shell, Partex, and Total, uh, is that uh, it has a very good knowledge uh, sharing. It brings various types of technologies from worldwide. Um, um, a lot of the, let's say, payments that are made from selling the oil actually returns back to the government. Uh, only a small percentage of that uh, goes for other companies. It also allows better management of the oil production here in Oman. So there are obviously uh, negatives, po positives and negatives maybe out of that, but it had worked very well in the last uh, few decades. And uh, inshallah it will continue as well because the agreement for PDO, it will run for the next uh, 20 years or so as a joint venture. Uh, so that's just to broadly answer your uh, question, but I'm not uh, kind of in a position to, to, to speak for the government on this behalf. Uh, thank you very much. If the fractures are not predictable in the reservoir, do you need to add them in your model? Uh, okay, so fractures actually uh, are predictable. There are many, many types of data that see fractures, mud losses, the mud that we lose in the subsurface are indicative of fractures. Image locks, we take images of the boreholes from inside using various tools, including uh, conductivity and resistivity of, uh, of uh, uh, tools, you know, something called FMI, or DHI tools. And these are also imaging fractures. We have also production data that are indicative of presence of fractures. We have well test data that can tell us of the presence of fractures. We have seismic attributes that can also image fracture data. So no, fractures are very much predictable and we can image them, we can model them. Our gas fields are drilled by Shell and BP, which are not, well, again, it's, it's out of the discussion here, but there are definitely some positives in involving international companies and um, the most important thing is obviously to manage the resources and maximize, uh, uh, you know, the returns for the for the government. Uh, so when we speak about fractures, how long they are? They can be any any length. So, but by by the way, from terminological point of view, a fracture is any crack on the surface of the earth. So a mid oceanic ridge that can be thousands of kilometers long is a fracture. Uh, a small, tiny, little, microscopic break in the rocks is a fracture. So a huge range of fracture length. Fractures with significant displacement, we call them faults, for instance. Fractures that occur, occur within uh, oceans and they lead to significant uh, you know, displacement of plates, we call them mid-oceanic ridges. Uh, in reservoirs, they, they vary, you know, they usually few hundreds of meters um, to a few kilometers. But f faults can be very long. They can be several kilo kilometers. There is a ratio, by the way. So for normal faults, a one kilometer of displacement is 60 kilometer length. That's for normal faults. For strike slip faults, usually it's much longer, probably one to 90 or one to 100. So one vertical uh, displacement of 10 meters, for instance, may lead to 1,000 meter, or sorry, even more in terms of length. So there is, uh, you know, there is a relationship for, for faults uh, on different types of faults.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gents. And uh, inshallah, you will enjoy the lectures next week. And uh, see you also next month as, as well about mining. Thank you very much.